welcome to This is CDR. If you guys haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're Zooming in from. I'm Toby Bryce, Brooklyn, New York, and I work on CDR policy advocacy with Open Air. This is CDR is an online event series we are presenting to explore the ever-widening range of CDR solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for some policy proposals we're working on for New York and that we hope to extend to other states and jurisdictions. Quick background on Open Air, if you're not familiar with us, Open Air is a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of CDR solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Our growing global community collaborates on shared open source missions in the area of research and development, policy advocacy, and activist market and business development. Um, there should be links to our website and to our Twitter in the chat. Please follow us on Twitter and you can join our group uh, via a link on our website. Quick background on CDR. Um, Definitions right here, uh, CDR um, activities that remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store them in the geosphere, um, ocean, or in long-lived products. Um, it's very important, first and foremost, to disclaim whenever we're talking about CDR that it is in no way any sort of substitution for uh, emissions reductions. Um, first and foremost, we need to decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, every credible climate forecast, including in very stark terms, the most recent IPCC AR6 shows that CDR will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century. That's billions of tons per year um, to counteract those emissions that are difficult or inequitable to abate and ultimately to start removing the tremendous excess of anthropogenic CO2 we already have in the atmosphere so we can restore our climate to a safer and healthier state. Um, we're currently only at megaton scale, order of magnitude, so we have a lot of work to do, all hands on deck, as they say, so uh, and that's why we're here today. Um, let me turn it over to my colleague, Mega, who will introduce today's speaker and get us going. Hi everyone, I'm Mega Raghavan, uh, based in London, and I also work on Open Air's CDR policy advocacy team uh, with a particular interest in the leg legislative policy opportunities for California, where I'm from. Um, this week, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Matthew Eisenman from Stony Brook University to review the oceanic carbonate cycle and to present CMATE, an electrochemical alkali alkalinity enhancement and CDR process that he's developing. A uh, couple of notes before we start. So we're going to begin with a 15 to 20 minute presentation, which will be followed by a few prepared questions, and then we'll go into moderated audience Q&A. So please type any questions you have for Matt into Zoom's Q&A box as we go along. Um, it is different from the chat box, so just make sure you find the correct uh, Q&A box so we can keep track of all your questions. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send the video link out to everyone who registered, and we'll also post it to Open Air's website and to our YouTube channel. We will also be live tweeting today's event, so our Twitter link should be in the chat. I think Naeem has already posted it, um, and please just follow along. If you tweet, the event hashtag is this is CDR. Um, and now on to the main event. So Matthew Eisman is an assistant professor in the electrical and electrical and computer engineering department at Stony Brook University. Professor Eisman received an AB in physics from Princeton in 2000, magna cum laude, a PhD from, in physics from Harvard in 2006, and was an NRC postdoc at NIST from 2006 to 2008. He's a member of the research staff at Xerox PARC from 2008 to 11, and a physicist at Brookhaven National Lab from 2011 to 14. He holds 18 patents and has co-authored 33 papers with over 4,000 citations. In the past 10 years, a significant part of Professor Eisenman's research efforts have been focused around uh, developing negative emissions technologies that capture CO2, uh, sorry about that, that capture CO2 from the air using natural ocean atmosphere equilibrium. Uh, Matt, over to you. Thanks a lot. I assume you can see the screen all right, or you'll let me know if you can't. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about a recently started project that we're calling CMATE, which stands for Safe Elevation of Alkalinity for the Mitigation of Acidification Through Electrochemistry. So a lot easier to say CMATE than all of that. Um, and I will be presenting today, but I want to acknowledge uh, my co-PI on this project, Dr. Brendan Carter from the University of Washington uh, and NOAA. So if we have an oil spill in the ocean, we clean it up, right? We, we, we clean up the mess that we create. Uh, and the premise of CMATE is that we should be doing the same thing with, with what is essentially the acid spill uh, being caused by CO2 emissions. So increasing carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in the atmosphere is leading to 
uh, increase acidity in the oceans. And just like we clean up after ourselves with, uh, with, with spills in the ocean, we should do the same in this case. Uh, and in fact, the ocean has absorbed about 31% of uh, human CO2 emissions so far. So this chart is just showing in the red solid line and the left axis, the atmospheric CO2 concentration over the years, which has been increasing. Uh, and at the same time, you can see in dark blue on the right-hand axis, uh, the dissolved CO2 in the, in the oceans increases, resulting in the light blue curve, the pH uh, decreasing, becoming more acidic. And so, you know, this absorption uh, of CO2 by the, the oceans um, has, has helped uh, keep the atmospheric concentration of CO2 lower than it would otherwise be, but it comes at the expense of these uh, more acidity in the oceans. So the process, the CMA process at a very high level, I'll get into a little more detail in a, a few more slides, but at a very high level, it's fairly simple. The two inputs are seawater and carbon-free electricity into this, this box that I've drawn here, which is an electrochemical system. And what it does is it uses that electrical energy to separate the salt, NaCl, the salt in seawater into its constituent acid, hydrochloric acid, HCl shown in red, and base. Um, and AOH, sodium hydroxide, shown in blue. So the acid is kept out of the ocean, and I'll discuss in a bit our plans for uh, actually selling that to generate revenue and using it for beneficial purposes, and the base is returned to the ocean. So what the CMA process is really doing is pumping acid out of the ocean. So it really can be viewed as um, uh, cleaning up after this spill of acid in the oceans. Uh, those of you who are are familiar with concepts like alkalinity will realize that this process, uh, the net result of this process is increasing the alkalinity in the oceans. And so the picture, um, the, the picture of the world with and without and with seamate is without seamate, we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, in equilibrium with dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean. And as that increases, uh, the oceans become more acidic as indicated by this hydrogen ion. Uh, in the equation, right? At a very high level, I'll break this down in, in future slides, but at a very high level with the CMATE process, that added alkalinity means that now additional carbon dioxide is taken up from the atmosphere, uh, but rather than leading to additional acidity, it's stored stably as bicarbonate HCO3, which is the, the most common form of, of uh, carbon storage in the ocean. And so, CO2 is drawn down from the atmosphere in the process, but it's stored um, in a non-acidic form. And in fact, if you look at the stores of carbon in the world, right? So this is gigatons of carbon, not gigatons of CO2 in the soils and atmosphere in the ocean. You see the ocean is actually a very natural location for carbon storage, right? Um, a, there are a lot of carbons, a lot of carbon in the surface ocean and the deep ocean, especially. And so what the process is doing is that acid removal and the associated increase in alkalinity allows us to draw down additional carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in bicarbonate, um, initially in the surface ocean and ultimately in the deep ocean, right? Um, and so we're increasing the capacity uh, for storing dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean. So just a little bit more about how the process works adding a little bit more detail from that high level view. Um, I mentioned that seawater and carbon-free electricity are the inputs. It can be seawater, but it can also be what I, what I call here existing brine waste streams. So for example, reverse osmosis concentrate that you might get um, from a desalination plant or a wastewater treatment plant are examples of that. And then the acid uh, is removed. We, we need to make sure that acid doesn't find its way back uh, into the ocean and reverse the process and sold for, for beneficial use. More detail on that uh, in a few slides. And then a little more detail on what's happening, uh, the net process when we return the base to the ocean. So there's an immediate, so I, I write these two chemical equations here and I'll walk you through them. The, the immediate in quotes, so it's very fast reaction is that, um, bicarbonate is converted to carbonate, right? So HCO3 is converted to CO3. And the pH increases in this process. So that's the immediate uh, reaction that happens very quickly. 
And the next thing that happens over the time scale of, of kind of weeks to months is that atmospheric carbon dioxide reacts with that carbonate uh, and is stored safely as bicarbonate, okay? And so initially this immediate reaction, the pH will increase maybe by 0.4 units. So um, we're designing the process so it will not, uh, the, the maximum increase in pH at any one time in any one place will be less than 0.4 units. So safe for marine life, but that initial pH spike of 0.4 units um, is as the CO2 is drawn down in this slower reaction, then decreases slightly, but not all the way back to the original pH value. So the net result is the pH is slightly raised. So ocean acidification is, is mitigated. And then two, additional atmospheric carbon dioxide is stored as bicarbonate. Um, and that storage as alkalinity is stable for 10,000 to 200,000 years. So very uh, stable, long lasting storage. Um, right, so the net result is uh, we're designing this first and foremost to be safe for marine life. So even at that point of, you know, the, the, the point where we return the base to the ocean, there will be some maximum temporary local change in pH upward, but we're designing it so that's less than or equal to 0.4 units. So even that area will be safe for marine life. And we'll be verifying that with, with studies to verify that it is indeed safe for marine life and we think likely beneficial for, for many marine organisms. Um, it's stable for over 10,000 years, which is great. And we're running detailed techno-economic analysis that indicates that um, this, should be, this should cost less than $100 per ton of CO2 ultimately. One, this is the most detailed slide on the electrochemistry just to explain what's inside that box. Um, it's something called, called bipolar membrane electrodialysis where you, uh, the simplest description is you just have a stack of many, many ion selective membranes between two end electrodes and you apply a voltage to those electrodes. So these orange cation membranes only allow positive charges to flow through them. The green anion membranes only allow negative charges to flow across them. And the bipolar membrane is basically a laminated anion and cation membrane together with a catalyst in the middle that dissociates water. And so um, under an applied voltage, you get acid hydrogen ions out of one side and hydroxide ions base out of the other side. So you can see if I flow salt NaCl up it, through the system, um, the, the result of this ionic flow across the membranes, the selective ionic flow is I get hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide out of alternating compartments, okay? So I'm just using energy to take a salt into its constituent acid and base. Okay, so we're, what's, the, what's the plan for the project? We're about six months into the project. It's a two-year project. Um, and the modeling tasks listed here are, are being performed by University of Washington and NOAA, Brandon Carter at University of Washington and NOAA. And then Stony Brook University um, is responsible for most of the experimental tasks. So um, first we're going to model the immediate vicinity. So that region where we return uh, the base and increase the alkalinity to the ocean uh, make sure we have a model of the, of the chemistry and, that allows us to verify safe operation and also use that model to feed back into the operation of the system. Um, number two, we're performing tank experiments. They should start in a couple of weeks. The tanks are, are together and, and filled and almost ready to go. And we're going to use ED here as electrodialysis to create alkalinity. So basically, we'll have a control tank and an experimental tank. And the experimental tank will, will perform this process. and um, and just to verify that the chemistry I described to you, the carbon dioxide uptake is indeed occurring. Uh, number three is in parallel, we're designing uh, and building a field test unit. So early next year, we wanna deploy a unit in the field um, to verify the, the operation uh, in real world conditions. And, and then task four is we start to think about deployment. So modeling large scale deployment, deployment means uh, modeling, imagine one of these systems of some substantial size. Um, there's a, a, let's say it's a coastal location, understanding how the seawater chemistry around that area um, is affected, making sure it's as effective as we uh, want it to be, and also allowing us to optimize the siting for these, for these units. As part of that, we're going to perform a techno-economic analysis task five and a life cycle analysis um, of the system. And as we get data 
from the experimental part of the program will feed that into that analysis. And then if everything looks good, if the economics continue to look good and, and the safety, we're convinced of the safety uh, to marine ecosystems, then uh, task six is a commercialization plan to think about how to actually deploy this uh, in the world. And so for the field test unit, we're really get, going to uh, modularize it. So shown here is just a shipping container, a 20 foot equivalent unit TEU, that's 20 feet by eight feet by nine feet. And so um, the systems we're designing, we can put about 200 tons of CO2 per year system in one of those boxes, right? So the system that would allow us to draw down 200 tons of CO2 per year would fit in one of those boxes. And um, for reference, if we had five of those boxes operating for a year, so that's a thousand tons of CO2 drawdown, um, the pH, the, the, the ocean acidification mitigation, the OA mitigation associated with that drawdown uh, would be increasing the pH by 0.1 units over about 1.6 1, 1. square kilometers. Um, so just to connect the scale of the CO2 drawdown with the OA mitigation of the process. So now I wanna talk a little bit about an important question, which is to have any meaningful impact on, on climate, you need to be able to scale whatever it is you're working on to something like one gigaton of carbon dioxide per year. So let's talk about that a little bit. And the first question will be the electricity needs. Um, so uh, this is based on experimental data. It should be around one and a half to two megawatt hours per ton, which means if I think of a five megawatt offshore wind turbine, and that nowadays is sort of a modest, modestly sized um, turbine, that's about 10 kilotons of CO2 per year, which means that a one gigawatt wind farm would give me one and a half to two megatons of CO2 per year and mitigate ocean acidification, that is raise the pH by 0.1 unit over about 30% of Chesapeake Bay's volume. Um, and an example of a one gigawatt uh, wind farm would be the Horn Sea Project in the North Sea which covers 407 square kilometers and has 174 turbines. So just, just to give a, a, a sense of the scale involved. This is not our plan of record. Uh, this is just an example of what if we had this ambitious plan to scale to 1 million tons of CO2 per year deployed capacity by 2025. And asking the question, will we run into any constraints? So are there any constraints even to getting to that one megaton of CO2 per year level um, if we're trying to scale to a gigaton? So um, this plan would assume you're essentially uh, increasing your capacity by about a factor of 10 per year. And then I've listed how many 20 foot equivalent units, how many shipping containers we'd be uh, cumulatively deployed in each year. So by the end, we'd have 5,000 of these shipping containers uh, deployed for a million tons of CO2 per year. Do we run into any hard constraints? So we looked at four. Um, first in blue is wing capacity and note the, the vertical axis is the fraction of the capacity of that thing that is used uh, versus a year. So uh, just move, there we go. Um, so in blue is, is wind capacity. So what we, what we said is, okay, we know the electrical consumption of the unit, how much wind capacity would we need in each year, assuming that plan for scaling. And you can see even in 2025 at a million tons of CO2 per year, we only are still using less than 0.1% uh, of the total capacity. Similar with the yellow, the reverse osmosis affluent. So what this means is imagine all the desalination plants in the world, uh, and all of the reverse osmosis concentrate that's generated, let's assume that's our, our input stream. Um, and again, even at a million ton per year level, we're only hitting the 0.1%, um, only consuming 0.1% of that, of that uh, resource. The orange is the hydrochloric acid market potential. So I mentioned we <clears throat> produce hydrochloric acid as a byproduct and we want to sell that. Now, an important caveat is the, the market we're assuming here in this, in this plot is not the existing HCL market. Um, the existing market's too small, it wouldn't allow us to, to scale to gigatons. So what we're assuming here is we've been exploring multiple new markets for dilute hydrochloric acid. And the one assumed here is basically using it to uh, treat um, 
waste from mines in a way that actually gets additional value to the mine and pulls down additional CO2. So assuming that process and how much of those uh, that waste is available, you can see again, only up to about 0.1% by 2025. And then finally uh, in green is membrane production. So I showed you this picture of the membranes, how many of those bipolar membranes are made every year. Um, and looking at that, we see that by the time we get to a megaton of CO2 per year, we do start hitting sort of a, a five to 10% level. Um, so what that tells us is in terms of um, hitting up against constraints, membrane production will be probably the first one uh, that we need to address. Just thinking about CMATE in terms of the usual metrics for carbon offsets, uh, additionality in this case is clear. Um, this wouldn't be done if we didn't deploy the system, so that's 100% additionality. The permanence is really good because of the, the residence time of this added alkalinity. And uh, we think in, within five years, um, quite a detailed technical economic analysis, uh, and we're still below $100 per ton in five years. Uh, in terms of scale, in principle, we can scale to multiple gigatons of CO2 per year. Um, we're not hitting up against any, any hard constraints necessarily. Um, in terms of verification, um, so we can measure directly the moles of acid and base that we're producing and then ground truth that to the, the tank and field test experiments where we verify the chemistry of what's going on and combine that with also with the modeling of the, of the sites. Um, in terms of equity, we think that you know, the fact that it's modular uh, means that it's not these centralized plants that sort of impose on regions, uh, but rather can be uh, more equitably uh, distributed because it's in these shipping containers and modular. Um, risk of harm, we've designed it so that the pH change is less than 0.4 units, and that's temporary maximum at the point of dispersal, and then ultimately the uh, when it comes to equilibrium, you know, we've shifted the pH up enough to, to counter ocean acidification, but no more. This should be safe for marine life. We think it would be beneficial to many shell forming organisms, but we will be uh, doing studies um, to verify that. Um, and then co-benefits are already talked about quite a bit, the, the mitigation of ocean acidification. Okay, I wanna, while I have you all here in this great community of uh, people, interdisciplinary people, uh, we need and want your feedback and help. So first, we're looking for field test locations. Um, and I have another slide on this in a minute with the requirements. So if you are aware of any, please get in touch with me. Um, we have some candidates, but the, the, the more options, the better. Um, Two, we want to evaluate the, as I mentioned, the benefits and potential unintended consequences to marine life. Um, and so we're interested in, in uh, performing those studies. So if you're a researcher in that area and are interested, get in touch with me. Um, if you have market knowledge about some of the things I talked about. So for example, likely buyers, uh, uses for dilute hydrochloric acid. We have our own ideas for that, but I, I bet people on this um, in the audience have their own good ideas or policy incentives, um, please get in touch. And then we are looking for collaborators to develop uh, the measurement verification certification protocol, right? So, and this is actually general for the field of ocean CDR, I would say, is that the, the field uh, as a whole needs to develop that, that tool and that protocol. On the field test site requirements, so we're looking for coastal locations uh, where we can, um, we can park two shipping containers and, and access for a tanker truck, uh, 30 kilowatts of electrical power, and then permitted um, intake and discharge. And we'd like to start uh, March 1st and a 12 month duration. So any leads on that, please get in touch with me. And we'd really like to thank uh, the Grantham Foundation uh, for funding and the really excellent um, group of advisors uh, uh, provided by Ocean Visions. And Thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions. That was great, Matt. Thank you so much. Um, really fantastic and very interesting and uh, inspiring work. Um, first question is a little more of a personal question, I would say. Um, can you talk a little bit about where CMake came from and its origin story and maybe how your 
academic research and career path from Harvard to Park to Brookhaven to Google to now Stony Brook um, led you to the idea? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I've been in this general field for about 10 years. So I did a, my PhD and, and postdoc were in sort of traditional experimental physics. And then I was a member of the research staff at Xerox Park uh, starting in 2008. And that's where I started uh, research in, in this field. So a little over 10 years ago. And, um, and so we worked on related areas at Park and then um, also led uh, what's called Project Foghorn at Google X. And both of those at Park and Google, what we were doing is related chemistry, but where we wanted to get CO2 out as a gas and then use it. Uh, for example, to make carbon neutral fuels. Um, and so in some sense in those projects, I got a good sense for some of the costs, right? That's a, that's a much more expensive and energy intensive thing to do if you want to get carbon dioxide out versus what we're doing here, which is just drawing it down. And so um, uh, I think it was last year or so I gave a talk at NOAA. Um, and so Brendan Carter, my co-PI on this project and I, uh, started discussing possibilities and and that led to CMATE, which is you know related but different from that past work uh, because we really just the, the whole goal is just to to pull down the co2 and store it not to to use it in a product cool um number two uh so ocean alkalinity enhancement um is a sometimes controversial even idea um in certain circles um i think most people would agree that the, you know, concerns about potential harms from adding material to the ocean are at scale or something we should be very careful about, as you clearly are in thinking about CMATE. Um, is CMATE different from certain other processes out there in that it, you're achieving the alkalinity enhancement by removing an existing material from the ocean? Um, I mean, you're still adding an AOH. So, like, does it make it a little bit less invasive or um, different from sort of natural carbonate cycles? Yeah, that's true. So I try and describe it as what we're really doing is removing HCl. So the net effect of what we're doing is removing hydrochloric acid. Um, we're returning NaOH. That NaOH, the sodium hydroxide, those molecules came from the ocean and we're putting them back. The net result is to increase alkalinity, but I think generally the community is still working about how to, to the taxonomy. Um, but I think in our case, these electrochemical approaches don't necessarily involve adding minerals, right? right. So in the, in the alkalinity enhancement uh, with adding minerals, one of the concerns is um, you may increase the concentration of certain elements um, quite a bit. And so, yeah, that's one advantage. In our case, we're not, we're not doing that. Got it. Um, this is gonna be a little repetitive for your, uh, from your presentation, but can we dig a little bit further into the, uh, HCl offtake from your process. Um, it, you know, I think to a civilian, it might sound a little bit different. Um, and uh, what are the risks and, and the obstacles? And, and can you talk a little more specifically about the commercial opportunity with HCl for people who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, sure. So that's definitely, you know, one of the big questions we have to answer is all of these, actually, if you look at all of these different processes that people are pursuing this one, you know, uh, in, in this field, each of them has their own byproduct, right? And so in some sense, that's why we should be doing, trying all of them and pursuing all of them because you probably want some of each byproduct instead of all of one. Uh, but in our case, we do generate what is considered dilute hydrochloric acid, right? So if you look at, if you want to buy hydrochloric acid wholesale, it's usually 32% by weight concentration. We're generating something like two to 6%. Um, also, if we want to, uh, scale to gigatons of CO2 per year, right? We can't just assume we're going to sell hydrochloric acid to existing markets because those markets aren't large enough. So we have to look for, for new markets that A, would welcome and be able to use dilute acid, hopefully, and B, um, uh, be large enough to allow us to scale. So one of the ones I mentioned, we're looking at a few, but one of the more promising ones is that it turns out uh, mines have a lot of waste that acid can be used to, to extract value from that waste actually, and then pull down additional carbon dioxide in the process. So that's one um, new market that we're looking at uh, for sure. But yeah, that's, that's a, an important question for this project is making sure we can, we can find markets that can absorb 
and use that C that HCL in a beneficial way. Got it. Uh, I'm gonna pirate uh, an audience question from Open Air member Dahl Winters um, that's related to this, just so we don't repeat it later. Um, she she kind of expresses some question about how saturated the current HCL market is in chemical manufacturing, which you just alluded to. Um, and in, and with respect to using HCL to treat mine tailings for additional carbon drawdown, um, what could that material possibly be used for aggregate and concrete? Have you looked at that at all? Uh, yeah, so that's one possibility depending on, on the material, um, but there are others as well, including metals, uh, but yeah. Got it. That, cool. that is a possibility. Yeah, I just uh, put, uh, Open Air has been involved with a low carbon concrete procurement bill um, for New York State, and 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 uh, decarbon or aggregate is one of the biggest um, sequestration opportunities in concrete. So, uh, so that's something that we're very interested in. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the possibilities for commercial deployment in New York, and maybe imagine a scenario? Um, you talked a little bit about offshore wind and um, and obviously, you know, Dave Cowie from Ocean Visions a couple of weeks ago talked about that being a, 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 the thing he was most excited about in terms of co-locating with offshore wind is CMATE. Um, can you talk a little more specifically about the scenario, what that would look like, how it might work, and can you work with curtailed um, electricity from offshore wind, or does it need to be dedicated? Uh, in principle, we could work with curtailed, but it, it, the larger question, I mean, New York is a really exciting place uh, for two two at least two reasons. Um, so I, I sort of hinted at the fact that I think uh, our process could be beneficial for shell forming organisms, right? And so we think that partnering with uh, aquaculture uh, could be uh, a real uh, opportunity. And then the second one is offshore wind. And so both of those things are going on in New York state, right? So with offshore wind, there are a couple of things. There's the electricity itself, um, the carbon free electricity itself, but there's also the infrastructure Right, so potentially sharing that infrastructure uh, in a in a slightly offshore deployment. Got it. Um, okay, last uh, last prepared question, and then we we have tons of really specific and good audience questions that Meg is going to um, process and, and deliver to you. Um, last question from us, though, is um, can you just sort of thumbnail the major policy issues? roadblocks that you see CMATE facing, maybe starting at a local and state level and then going up to federal and then international, if there's any international re uh, relevance, I guess you're on the coast, so maybe that's less of an issue. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing is just, I think for the field in general is making sure that, that these ocean CDR approaches are considered like when legislation is allowing for certain uh, offsets, right, that, that we are included in that. I think that's probably yeah. the main one. And then obviously, you know, when we're working in the oceans, permitting is, uh, is always an issue, but um, that's why we're performing the safety studies. Got it. So you have the permits for the actual facility. Is there anything in current policy that you're aware of that in itself would keep you from your process of pulling the HCL out and returning an AOH? No, it shouldn't be. be uh, and partially because the, uh, the change is so small, right, which is sort of part of the design, the reason for that design for safety. And because of that safety, it it should make it feasible for the permitting. Got it, cool. Um, Naga, do you wanna start doing some of the audience questions? Yep, well, I have tons of questions. Um, one, I think that we got from a couple of people was basically around the, you know, the salt ions that go into it. So the question is, should the system be robust to different concentrations of salt and to different temperatures or, you know, how does, uh, the change in those ions uh, impact things more broadly? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, if um, we can take seawater as input and we can take reverse osmosis brine as input. And in fact, the more concentrated in some sense, the better um, for us. Uh, and so within the range of likely encountered concentrations, we can handle any of those. Um, and same thing, I think, with with likely encountered temperatures um, uh, operates. We don't expect any extreme temperatures, and so within the range that we would expect from from the intakes, like seawater or uh, uh, desalination plant or wastewater treatment plant, um, you know, it's something to consider. But I don't think it's going to be a major obstacle. Okay. And in terms of, I guess, the output, um, is there an impact on the temperature of the water that that gets kind of really, or, you know, in the area that you're working on, um, does it 
you know, change or raise or lower the water temperature of the area you're in? Uh, very, very little, if at all. So in principle, if you run at a very high current density, it depends, you know, a very high current density with somewhat uh, low flow of, of solution, it could raise it potentially by a few degrees, but um, generally nothing like you would see from like power plants or, or plants like that. Yeah, we actually had a couple of questions around power plants and the temperature um, temperature difference associated with that. So someone said, um, perhaps sites associated with coastal power plants could be used considering the need for electricity and perhaps the benefit of using water, warmer water uh, containing that waste heat from the power plant. Is warmer water a better input for the process or is that kind of a, an idea you've considered? Uh, the, in that case, the temperature would be less of a benefit than, but absolutely um, any facility on the coast that's pumping seawater um, would be beneficial to, to pair with or partner with. Okay, cool. Um, someone asked a question about the sort of the verification and the measurement. So, you know, basically thinking about the fact that it takes some time from the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to actually get absorbed, you said it might take weeks to months. Um, and they cited a study using sargassum algae, uh, which basically said, you know, the, the length of time it takes for the atmos atmospheric CO2 to actually inflow into the surface water takes longer than that kind of contact uh, that the surface water has with the atmosphere. So how do you think about verification in this case? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important question. Um, uh, my colleague, Brendan Carter, is really the best person to answer this. And I do see that he's answering some questions in the chat, which is great. <laughs> um, uh, but we've, we've talked a lot about this verification question for us and for other ocean CDR. And, I, and that's why I sort of tried to advertise that I think we as a community do need to develop those protocols. So I sort of outlined what we think is uh, a good strategy for us, which is we're performing some controlled experiments. So for example, right? And in those controlled experiments, we'll uh, verify uh, the time scale for CO, CO2 uptake um, and per mole of, for example, uh, acid and base. Then in the actual deployment, and we'll do field tests as well, where we do similar things, uh, where we're actually uh, uh, measuring the result. Uh, then in a deployment, we, can, we will count, you know, we can count how many moles of acid and base we're making. So we know that. Uh, uh, and then based on those measurements and the known um, properties of that location, plus the modeling, we can um, uh, determine what, what the uptake was. So th then the other piece of that is we'll have some sensors in the ocean to look at changes, but because that you're, you're right, because the, the uptake that, that CO2 uptake, um, is sort of weeks to months, that means that, uh, it, it's not like we'll be able in all deployments to measure directly all the CO2 uptake at every location. Right. So we basically the proxies are near, near the, the place where we return the base to the ocean. We perform uh, we, we uh, measure the seawater chemistry in those places, and then based on prior measurements plus modeling, we can infer what's going on. Yep, makes sense. Um, we got a few more technical questions, so I'm going to go into those now. Um, so one of the questions was, you mentioned that CMATE would work with the brine that is the output from desalination plants. Um, would it also work with hydrogen electrolyzers, which don't extract all the hydrogen and oxygen from water? Uh, and if so, how would you follow that up? Uh, so I'm not exactly sure of the question, but anything, let's say, uh, any brine waste brine stream, uh, in principle, we could take as input. Depending on the specific one, we may have to pre-treat, depending on what else is in the stream. Okay. Because it's uh, really just just to say, you know, it's really the it's the sodium chloride that we're using to make the acid in the base. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question was is CO2 released in the acid production chamber at all? No, so actually the way, uh, that's a good question. Um, in chemical engineering parlance, I think they call this kind of feed and bleed. So essentially you have in the acid loop, you come in at something like 2% and then the, the membrane stack concentrates it to two and a half percent. And so actually the input to the acid loop, I showed it in a very schematic way just uh, to try and uh, describe at a high level what's going on, but in fact, it's not like you're feeding seawater into the acid compartment. 
um, you actually have a closed loop of acid in the acid compartment. Right, okay. Um, someone asked, I think, based on one, some of your previous papers, um, some of your previous papers looked at a basic IOC, a basic as an, I think, alkaline IOC process. Um, why are you pursuing the acid IOC process with CMATE, and why couldn't you do both within a, the same system? Yeah, actually, I would say we're pursuing neither. Um, so yeah, some of the past work, we called it, um, there's an acid process or a base process. So in, the, in those past, what, what we call the acid process was adding acid to to shift the carbonate chemistry so that we could strip CO2 gas out. That was the more common one that we looked at. Um, and then just for completeness, we also, well, you could actually add so much base that you precipitate, um, but that's sort of a bad idea because that process itself releases CO2. Um, this is actually, the CMATE is neither of those because we're pulling down as bicarbonates. So it's really different from those. Right, okay. Um, another one of the questions on the process was just, could you go into a bit more detail about the membranes and the catalyst and what kind of challenges do you see in deploying those materials that you would need for those things at scale? Yeah, so that um, that's a commercial off the shelf technology. Um, so I think there's there's certainly room for, for cost reduction, but in terms of the technology itself, it's nothing we necessarily have to invent. So those bipolar membranes, uh, you can buy square meters of them. Uh, yeah, and I said a catalyst. So basically how those work are, it's anion and cation membrane laminated together. And at the junction, there's a catalyst that enhances the dissociation of water so that the applied voltage gives you the hydrogen and hydroxide on the other side. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, the materials and the equipment exists. But as I mentioned with the constraint slide, we, you know, if we're scaling to gigatons of CO2 per year, we may have to think about just production volumes of of those materials. Yeah, makes sense. Um, uh, we had a question on whether this could be applied to rivers. So rivers can also transport organic uh, carbon to the ocean through weathering or erosion of uh, aluminum silicate and carbonate rocks on land by the decomposition of life. Um, so would you think about ever applying that technique to rivers or does it just not make sense given the small amount of water uh, compared to the ocean? Yeah, and also the concentration. So higher concentration of salt is better for us. Right. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think probably the economics don't work out on the on the river. Got it. Yeah. Um, we had another question on the economics as well, which was uh, so hydrochloric acid currently selling for forty three dollars per metric ton. Um, costs here are projected at 100 per metric ton. I think in your presentation, um, and they're saying carbon credits are currently about four to five dollars in the US. Um, so could you describe a bit more about how you see the ability to you know, make the costs work out? Yeah, for sure. So the first thing to say is those are two separate things. So the $40 per ton for the hydrochloric acid is per ton of 32% by weight hydrochloric acid, whereas $5 per ton for a carbon credit is per ton of CO2. So those are, those are different things, first of all. Um, but the other thing is uh, basically we uh, our production costs are less than $100 per ton, assuming no value for the acid. So, mm -hmm. and also assuming no waste disposal. So basically we can be less than $100 per ton if we generate the acid and, and then pretend it magically doesn't exist. So uh, kind of worst case, we have to pay something for some sort of neutralization or disposal. Uh, but in the best case where we can sell it for some value, then it just decreases our uh, production cost further below, e even further below $100 per ton. And so what that means is we should be able to, what, whatever the kind of the wholesale price is for hydrochloric acid, we should be able to sell for less than that. The caveat there is, as I mentioned, we're making relatively dilute acid, um, which is why we're looking for, for new markets that can use that because most existing people would want 32%. Got it. Um, there were a couple of questions about just like the longer term impact. So one was, um, what do you think about the longer term impacts about changing the pH of the ocean? Um, you know, obviously you're testing it on a short, shorter time period, but are there any potential concerns in the longer run? That was the uh, yeah, I mean, well, uh, so to reverse the change in pH that we've witnessed the acidification to completely reverse acidification, 
globally over the entire all the oceans you know we would be deploying at at t tens of gigatons of co2 per year right um and even if we did that all we would be doing is returning the ph back to where it was so uh no i'm not concerned makes sense um and someone also asked um since it might improve shell formation for calcifying organisms do you think it could actually be a like a restoration tool in its own right yeah absolutely yeah so we're interested in in partnering with aquaculture and uh industry uh, along those lines and and restoration efforts right um and one thing we do want to quantify is uh, you know if if we uh improve the uh shell formation and and that means that these organisms are making more shells in fact that process itself releases some amount of co2 and making sure we account for that in our life cycle analysis that are that we subtract that from our net co2 drawdown right okay um in terms of just thinking about aquaculture, if if you have like a you know an estuary with brackish water, is that enough of a salt concentration for this kind of process, or do you really need like a salt water, seawater kind of concentration? Yeah, you can. We can operate with brackish, um, but again, it's just the economics are better the more concentrated it is to start. Makes sense. Um, and someone asked if there are any synergies with seawater lithium extraction. Um, yeah, I mean, you can imagine using some of the similar electrochemistry uh, in that case, but I, I think combining them might not be, you, know, you may separately pursue that with similar chemistry, but I'm not sure that you would want to combine the two projects. Got it, makes sense. Um, I'm just going to finish with one more question about sort of how people can get involved because, you know, at Open Air, uh, our whole volunteer community pretty much revolves around these missions that we have, which are specific goal oriented activities that we intend to advance CDR in the real world. And so that could inv involve things like, you know, writing and campaigning for legislation, uh, collaborative scientific research, building things. Uh, we have a huge R&D community as well. Um, and you mentioned sort of at the end of your presentation, something about opportunities to help and help you, you know, scout locations or things like that, which seem very aligned to, I think, what a lot of people at Open Air are interested in doing. Um, so in very, I guess, practical, concrete terms, how would members of our community help you find possible test sites or other things like that? What would be the first step or guidelines to kind of get people involved? Yeah, I mean, the first step is if you have, if you think uh, you have ideas that could help and you're interested email me, I'm easily findable online. So uh, my name at stonybrook.edu. Cool, um, I think we're at the end of our questions then. So thanks so much. That's been super interesting for me. And I think based on the chat to everyone involved, um, I'm just gonna hand it back to Toby to close things out for us. Right. Matt, thank you again. That was really fantastic. Um, I uh, want to talk a little bit about what we have coming up. Um, next week, we are going to be dark. Uh, Climeworks is launching their GAC Summit, which is a really fantastic program. We'll put a link to that in the chat, and uh, definitely we'll be there and definitely encourage everyone to uh, join that who's interested in direct air capture and CDR. Following week, we have Dave Goldberg from Columbia Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and he's going to talk to us about the geologic sequestration opportunity for um, carbon dioxide in New York State. The 28th, we have uh, Chris Magwood from the Endeavor Center, who is going to talk to us about the uh, carbon sequestration opportunity in our built environment, in concrete and in other uh, building products. And then October 1st, 5th, we have uh, Christoph Butler from, um, from Climeworks, and then a bunch of other great presentations, again, running through the fall. We'll post a series link in the chat. We'll post a link to uh, Dave on the 21st. Please register. And um, thank you again for, uh, for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.